We can expect an unimaginable time of trouble in the last days, such as the world has never seen before. That's what Scripture tells us. But we need not be afraid. His word shaping our story. The year was August 1948, and a young preacher, George Vandeman, was preparing to take the pulpit. As he did so, a Sabbath hush fell over the new grounds as members mixed gratitude with happy hearts for the work accomplished and for their new auditorium. That was 70 years ago, and Central California Conference continues the legacy of Soquel Camp Meeting today. Soquel, an embodiment of America's camp meeting, has become a timeless tradition of faith intersecting with culture, pleasure bursting with praise, and truth uniting with tradition. It is camp meeting time once again. We invite you to join us as we worship our Creator together and let our stories and the stories that are yet to come be shaped yet again. Early in his career, Dr. John Pauline was a church pastor in New York and Michigan. After teaching at the Seventh-day Adventist Seminary at Andrews University for many years, he came to Loma Linda University in 2007 as Dean of the newly formed School of Religion. Dr. Pauline is a well-respected biblical scholar and a prolific writer. He has written dozens of book reviews and has been published on topics relating to the history of the Adventist Church and the Book of Revelation. He is a specialist in the Johannan literature in the New Testament, Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation, and the intersection of faith with contemporary culture. Dr. John Pauline received his bachelor's degree in theology from Atlantic Union College, which included a year abroad studying in West Germany. He achieved his MDiv degree in 1975 and his PhD in New Testament in 1987 from Andrews University. Outside of academia, Dr. Pauline enjoys being with his wife, Pamela, and their three children, and also enjoys travel, golf, and photography when time permits. Please welcome Dr. John Pauline. During the messages that I've been invited to give, we'll be taking a look at the book of Revelation and taking some of the most difficult texts in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 17, and taking a fresh look at them in the light of our theme. We have this marvelous theme, his word shaping our story. And sometimes the book of Revelation is studied in a way that doesn't shape our story, in a way that's just important stuff to know, but it doesn't always change our lives. And, and tonight and throughout this series, I want to focus on the question, how does it make my life better? How am I a better person because I studied the book of Revelation? If any of you are interested in going deeper, those of you who are here, the Book Center has a number of materials uh, that you can follow up on. But tonight we're going to look at Revelation 13. And many of you, if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, you probably have heard many sermons on Revelation 13. Maybe you haven't heard one like tonight. But Revelation 13 has been important within the Adventist context, and it raises the question, if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, who are you? What is your mission? What did God put you on this earth to do? If you're here tonight and you're not a Seventh-day Adventist, welcome. You can enjoy listening in from the side and seeing where that might interest you. But I want to talk a little bit about Adventist identity, what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist, and how Revelation 13 helps to explain some of that. So let's go to the text. I believe we have a picture here. <laughs> here we are. Terrific. All right. So when you talk about Adventist identity, Seventh-day Adventist identity, in the past, it has tended to be negative. What do I mean by that? You ask a Seventh-day Adventist, who are you? And they say, well, you know, we keep the Sabbath. 
but we're not Jewish. And we believe in the Trinity, but we're not Catholic. And we baptize people by immersion, but we're not Baptists. You, you get the drift? In other words, our identity has tended to be negative in the past. We have tended to say, okay, here's what we are not. But I believe that God has called the Seventh-day Adventist Church for a unique mission in this world. There are many Christians in many denominations, many people that are close to God, that love him, love Jesus, follow him. But I do believe that God has called the Seventh-day Adventist Church for a unique mission, a mission that perhaps others are not in the same place to give. It reminds me that about 20 years ago, a number of us had a dialogue with the Lutheran World Federation. And uh, these are the leaders of the Lutheran Church around the world. And it was, it was a wonderful experience. And uh, met some very, very fine Christians uh, at those conversations. I had the privilege of presenting Revelation 13 to the leaders of the Lutheran World Federation. And when it was done, an interesting thing happened. After many discussions back and forth, they said, you know, for us Lutherans, the book of Revelation is not that important. We can see that it's really important to you. And here's a beautiful thing that they said. They said, we can see that the message that you have should go out to the world. We can't give it for you because we don't see Revelation the way you do. But we want to give you our blessing. Wasn't that amazing? Wasn't that a beautiful, Christ-like thing to do? Doesn't that say something beautiful about the God these Lutherans worshipped? I appreciated that so much, but they said, we realize this message that you are giving is so important. In fact, I shared some of the things I'm going to share tonight, and one of them said, a, a theologian from Germany, he said, would it be okay if a Lutheran gave that message? And I said, of course. It's simply taking it out of the Bible. So we've had a negative pointing at our identity, and I would like to argue we need a more positive identity. We need to tell the world this is what we are about. This is what God has called us to share. Whether you accept it or not, it's between you and God. But this is what God has called us to share, who we are as a people. This really came close to me uh, not too long ago, because I took a group of pastors to Turkey. We were having uh, classes in the Middle East for a whole quarter when I was at the seminary, and we had about 37 pastors, and uh, they were taking classes in Jerusalem, and we did a tour of Turkey while we were there. Now, I don't know if it was something we ate in Egypt or something we ate in Turkey the first day we were there. But the second day while we were in Turkey, driving bus all through the countryside, we all got sick. It was a kind of a stomach flu. And the people in the front would get it really, really bad. It was one of those things where you're making stops in the countryside, you know, boys to the right, girls to the left. You, you know what I'm talking about? It was really, really bad. And 37 health-reforming Seventh-day Adventist pastors are sicker than dogs. The guide and the driver are Muslim. Chain smokers never bothered them a bit. They were fine the whole time. And you know what? When pastors are sick, they can be crabby. They can be annoying. They can whine and complain. Not all pastors, not yours, I'm pretty sure. But this group was really tough to deal with. And there was one or two times I had to talk the guide into staying with the tour because he was just sick of it all, you know? And at the end of the tour, we got to Philadelphia. Now, the Turks don't call it that. I believe it's Aleshehir in Turkish. But uh, Philadelphia was the Greek name of that city back in Bible times. 
It's one of the seven churches of Revelation. And Philadelphia means brotherly love. Now, we had come from Egypt, and in Egypt, what tended to happen was uh, bakshish. If you've ever been there, you know what it's a little kid will come up and, and go like this, bakshish, which is kind of like a tip, yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, so we were kind of used to that. Uh, you know, we do something for you, bakshish for me. And I was going through the fruit market there in, uh, in Philadelphia, Alicia here, and a man, oh, he was excited. Come over here, here, take my picture. Take a picture of my stand. He had a vegetable stand. And I'm kind of like, I don't want his picture. <laughs> and if I take his picture, he's going to want bakshish or something, you know? But somehow or other, I decided, okay, okay. So he poses in front of his vegetable stand. I take the picture. And I'm about to turn away. He says, wait a minute, just a minute. And he reaches under. He pulls out a bag, fills it with vegetables, hands it to me and says, thank you. That was turkey. And then I went down the street with, uh, with several of the students, and we stopped into this little shop. And they made cheese bread. It was just a long thing like this. And a little bit of cheese in the center, and it was baked with herbs, and they, they had a salad to go with it. It was totally delicious. It was absolutely amazing. And eight of us ate that lunch together. And when I went for the bill, it was $5. I did not feel good walking out of there with such a wonderful meal for $5. And so I gave them, you know, something like six and a half. You know, you don't want to overdo it, right? That can be embarrassing to people. So I, I, I left them about six and a half dollars and uh, let them know we really appreciate it. And then my wife and I and the kids went back to the bus and the students were finishing up. And we got to the bus and the students didn't come and the students didn't come. And, and finally when they came, you know, what delayed you? They said, well, they said the fellow was so overwhelmed with your gift that they made a whole second meal for us, and, and here it is. I don't know what it is about this place, but the brotherly love thing seems to still be a reality there. Absolutely amazing. So here we are, health-reforming pastors, making their way through Turkey, making everyone miserable, and the Turkish people were so absolutely nice. And you know what the subject of conversation was from that time on? Why are we even doing this? Why are we giving the message? The Turkish people are more Christ-like than we are. Why should we even give the message? Well, that's a tough one to answer, especially after you've been with them on that whole tour. And we got back to Jerusalem where we were staying, and a couple days later, there was a knock at the door. We opened the door, and it was the president of the General Conference, Elder Robert Falkenberg at the time. And he says, well, he says, I heard that you had the group here, and I heard you might be having supper. Well, come on in, have supper with us. And so we had the general conference president sit down and have supper with us. And while we were eating, I said, you know, we have a group of uh, pastors here, students. Would you mind maybe afterward taking some questions? He says, absolutely, that would be delightful. And so after the supper was over, we uh, made arrangements. We gathered together in the classroom. And what do you suppose the first question was? We just came back from Turkey. Here's how we behaved. Here's how they behaved. What do we have to share with them? What is the identity of Adventism? Why would one even want to share? And he said something very interesting, very simple answer. He said, we are a people of prophecy. We may not be kinder and gentler 
than other people. We may not be more Christ-like than other people, but we have a prophetic message that the world needs to hear. That's the identity that he set before us, and I want to explore that concept tonight. A prophetic movement. Why do Seventh-day Adventists exist as a people of prophecy? For a special time in history, a time when things will not be as they seem. Things will not be as they seem. That is the situation of the world at the end of time. Now, you can't see it from here, but if you drive just a few miles from here, you come to the Pacific Ocean. And if you get up on one of those cliffs and you look down over the ocean and you see the line of the horizon, what do you realize? The world is flat, right? It's flat. Hmm. Things are not always what they seem. We know the world is round, but it doesn't always look that way. I remember when my oldest daughter was two and a half. We had grown up uh, to that point in an apartment and just moved into our first house. And she had seen apartment duties you know, vacuuming and dishes and all the rest of that, but she'd never seen yard work before. And I remember we inherited with that house an electric lawnmower. I don't know why people would do that, but we inherited that lawnmower, so I was gonna use it, it's free, right? And so I got this 100-foot cord, plugged it into the lawnmower, and I'm going back and forth mowing the lawn trying not to run over the cord. And my daughter comes out on the back deck and she's watching me go back and forth. And you can see that little brain was just going like, what is daddy doing? She had no idea what I was doing out there. She's going back and forth with this electric machine and suddenly she got it. She understood. And she ran back in the house, says, mommy, mommy, guess what? Daddy's cleaning the grass. <laughs> All that she knew was vacuum cleaners, you see? Daddy's cleaning the grass. Things are not always what they seem. This is a major purpose of the book of Revelation. In the last days of Earth's history, things will not be as they seem. In the last days of Earth's history, what your eyes see and what your ears hear will deceive you. At such a time, what is there to do? It is to stay close to the Word of God, particularly the prophecies of the Bible. It would be nice if Seventh-day Adventists were models of Christ-like behavior be kinder and gentler than anybody in the neighborhood and recognize for that, that would be nice. But even if it is not so, the message still bears delivering because you see, the book of Revelation is 2,000 years old. That message has been there all the time, but God did not cause people to really get interested until fairly recently. And the Seventh-day Adventist church is simply people who read the book of Revelation, drew certain conclusions that God is calling a people to share this with the world. If no one else will do it, we'll do it. And that's one thing I learned with the Lutherans. The way that we read Revelation, it was totally new to them. It, 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 it was not what they had ever seen or heard before. And they were intrigued enough to say, well, you know, we really think you should go out and give this message. You know, the, the world needs to hear it. We're, we're not going to be able to do it for you, so this is going to be your message. Have you ever heard of The Matrix? It's an interesting story that uh, uh, became a powerful movie about 20 years ago. It's a story about computers getting smarter and smarter 
We kind of heard about that, right? They get smarter and smarter until eventually they're so smart and so powerful that they take over the human race. And they take all the human beings and they use their bodily processes like batteries, creating energy for the machines. And uh, in order to keep them quiet, they fed an imaginary world into their heads. And these human beings felt like they were living real lives. They could see things, hear things, smell things, taste things. It was like real life, but it wasn't real. It was only computer signals implanted in their brains. Now, you know, this is not a true story, but people tell a story like that for a purpose. And that story is particularly powerful today in the light of the book of Revelation because the message of the story is things are not always what they seem. What you see and hear and taste and smell and touch may not be real, may not be the real deal. That's the message of Revelation 13. Let's start with the beginning, and that's Revelation 12, 17. I don't know if you knew this, but the chapters and the verses in the Bible are not original, okay? When John wrote the gospel, he didn't put chapters and verses, okay? That was done later on. So chapter 12, 17 is really the opening to chapter 13. It's crucial to start here if you want to understand chapter 13. And it says, the dragon was angry with the woman. He went away to make war with the remnant of her seed, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. All right, so you have two characters here in this story. You have the dragon and you have the remnant. And the final stages of Earth's history is going to be a battle between the dragon and the remnant. Now, what it tells us here in this text is interesting. It says the dragon went away to make war with the remnant of her seed. That's an odd statement. If you want to make war, why do you go away? Where I grew up in New York City, we call that chicken, you know? You want to make war with somebody? You don't go away. You know, Elder Kano, your president, uh, he's in the back room there. If I wanted to make war with him, what would I do? I'd go right back there and punch him in the nose, right? I mean, okay. So, oh, oh, there you are. Okay. All right. Well, I have good news for you. Not tonight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That was just an illustration. Not tonight, but tomorrow, be on, be on your watch. Okay, so if I want to make war, you just go right up and you attack. The dragon goes away. Why does he go away? Because he's a loser. If you read chapter 12, you see the dragon attacks the male child, and he attacks up in heaven, and he attacks the woman, and each time he fails, he never succeeds. He's a loser. Now he's coming to the very last battle of Earth's history, and he realizes he needs help. So he's going to go and get some allies. That's the setting for chapter 13, a dragon in need of allies. And where does he go to find allies? If you read the text, he goes to the beach. That's what he does. It's right there in the text. So in Revelation 12, 17, you set the context here. The dragon goes to the beach looking for allies, and what you discover is that Revelation 13 unpacks the dragon's war. In chapter 13, we see how the dragon decides to make war with God's people at the end of time. Chapter 14, that's the remnant's response. So you see, chapter 12, 17 is a nutshell summary of the two chapters that follow. Does that make sense? All right. It, it helps to simplify what you're reading if you know that, uh, that basic information. So you have a summary in 12, 17. Then in chapter 13, the dragon's war is the topic. 
what we're covering tonight. And then chapter 14, the remnant's response is the topic. We're going to cover that tomorrow morning. All right? So, the dragon's war is the focus of chapter 13. You have the dragon. He goes to the beach, and he calls up a beast from the sea. And then he turns around, and he calls up a beast from the earth. So you have the dragon, you have the sea beast, and the land beast. And it's what I call a cartoon fantasy. You see, we actually know what Revelation is like because we have similar literature in today's world. We call them cartoons. Cartoons can often be animal stories, animals that talk. For example, The Lion King, probably my favorite cartoon. Is The Lion King an animal story? Hmm. Sort of, right? But it's not really an animal story. Lion King is really about people and groups of people and how they relate to each other. It's told through the eyes of animals, all right? It's an African apocalypse. You have a perfect world that gets ruined, and then it's redeemed by a son. So the book of Revelation is kind of like that cartoon. It's an animal story and the animals interacting with other, each other, but they are really systems of power that are mimicking God in this world. So the book of Revelation is a cartoon fantasy designed to teach us something very important about God and opposition to God and the shape that all of that will take in the end time crisis. So you have a dragon, you have a sea beast, and you have a land beast. How many does that make? There's three. God, in the book of Revelation, is portrayed in threes. He's the one who is and was and is to come. He's the one who also is with Jesus Christ and with the seven spirits before his throne. God is portrayed in threes. Is it possible that you have a counterfeit trinity in chapter 13? Could the dragon be a counterfeit of God the Father? Could the sea beast be a counterfeit of the Son? Could the land beast be a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit? Is that possible? Don't take my word for it. Let's go to the text. We'll start with the dragon. And the theory is that the dragon represents or counterfeits God the Father. Well, let's take a look at the possibility. Both of them are leader figures, so that works. Both of them sit on thrones, so that works. Both of them delegate authority to others. Now, that's not compelling by itself, is it? But at least it fits. But let's go a little bit deeper. Let's go into chapter 13 itself. Revelation 13 and verses 1 through 5. Start with the first verse. I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. All right. Have you seen anything like that in nature? As I mentioned this morning, only if you've been drinking. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, this is not natural. Animals don't normally talk either, okay? So, cartoons don't have to play by the rules. So, you have an animal with ten horns and seven heads. So, you know this is unlike anything we have in creation. But, if you were to go up on the hill and see two animals with seven heads and ten horns, what would you know? You've discovered a new species. This beast that comes up out of the sea has ten horns and seven heads. What do you know about the dragon in chapter 12? It has ten horns 
and seven heads. The sea beast looks just like the dragon. Do you remember what Jesus said? We covered it this morning. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you see the sea beast, you've seen the dragon. You see, the book of Revelation is building this beast as a counterfeit of Jesus Christ. But let's look further at the evidence. Verse 2, the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Where did Jesus get his authority from? Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. He received it from his father. The sea beast gets his authority from the dragon. Third, one of the beast's heads was as if it had been slaughtered to death, but the wound of his death was healed. Now, that's my translation. Many of your Bibles talk about a deadly wound, which sounds almost fatal, right? But the actual language there is slaughtered to death. Now, there are several words for killing and death in the Greek. The particular word chosen here is repeated in verse 8, where it talks about the lamb slaughtered from the foundation of the world. This beast is mimicking the cross of Christ. And if someone is killed and they are healed, what do you call that healing? A resurrection. This beast has a death and a resurrection like Jesus. Verse 5, he was given authority to operate for 42 months. How long is 42 months? It's three and a half years. How long is three and a half years? The length of Jesus' ministry was three and a half years. This beast from the sea is a counterfeit of Jesus Christ. Let's summarize. He looks like the dragon. He receives his authority from the dragon. He has a death and a resurrection and a ministry of three and a half years. This beast from the sea is a counterfeit of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're a Seventh-day Adventist familiar with evangelistic services, that fits right in with what you've heard there. But it takes it deeper into the story. Tonight, I want to focus on the story because often we talk about history, but we don't always pay attention to the details in the story, which can be tremendously helpful. All right? So the sea beast is a counterfeit of Jesus Christ. Let's go a little further. We have a beast from the earth. Revelation 13, 12 to 15. It says, he, the land beast, exercises all the authority of the first beast in his behalf. So what does that tell us? The land beast didn't come to glorify himself. The land beast didn't come to promote himself. He came to promote the sea beast. When Jesus talks about the comforter, what does he say about the Holy Spirit? He will not speak of himself, but he will testify of me. The Holy Spirit didn't come to promote himself. He came to promote Jesus. The land beast didn't come to promote himself. He came to promote the sea beast. And it says he does great signs to cause fire to come down out of heaven to earth in the presence of men. Did the Holy Spirit ever make fire come down from heaven? Pentecost. All right. So what we know of the Holy Spirit includes fire from heaven. That's a very pointed reference. And then finally, he was permitted to give breath to the image of the beast. That word breath in the Greek is pneuma. It's the same word as spirit. The Holy Spirit 
The land beast is a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. He directs worship to another. He performs great signs and wonders. He brings fire from heaven, and he gives life and breath. So the land beast is a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. So we're dealing here with a counterfeit trinity. It's what I call the secular trap. In a scientific world, we trust in the five senses. Truth is determined by what you see, what you hear, what you touch, taste, and smell. Scientific method is simply using the five senses to study the environment around us and to learn all that we can. And science is tremendously important, tremendously helpful. I work at a science university, Loma Linda University. So there's a lot of scientists there, and we have a great deal of faith in science, especially when it comes to healing. But the message of Revelation is that in the last days of Earth's history, things will not be as they seem to be. And those who trust in the five senses can be deceived. You have a true trinity, you have a counterfeit trinity in the last days. So what is Adventist identity? What is that positive side? If somebody says, who are you? I think we can say this. As Elder Falkenberg once said, we are a people of prophecy. That God, in the scriptures, gave prophecies of what the world would be like just before Jesus returns. And in those prophecies, God made clear that there would be a great end time deception, that things would not be as they seem to be. And if people are really up on Hollywood and stuff like that, you can say, have you ever seen The Matrix? Do you understand that in, in this world today, people are realizing it's easy to be deceived? Have you heard of fake news? Okay, what is fake news? Fake news is news when sometimes you find out it wasn't so. A, a preliminary report or something went out too fast or somebody was hoping it would turn out in a certain way, and they call that fake news. Well, people have become very much aware. You don't trust even what the media say. You don't assume anymore that if it's in the New York Times, it's fit to print. Things have changed. We live in a world of image, where image is more important than reality. And in that world, it's easy to be deceived. And that's the world in which we live. And God has placed in his word a message for a time like this. The mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is to a world that is in danger of deception, preparing the world to deal with those issues in the final crisis of Earth's history, to help the world to realize that trust in the five senses, as powerful as it is, as truth-leading as it can be, trust in the five senses at the end of time will deceive. The mission of the Adventist church is to point people to the Word of God. For those of you that know Ellen White, that was her mission too. She says, I am a lesser light. I am shining so that you can find your way to the greater light to understand God's word, to know God's word. That is crucial. In the last days of Earth's history, things will not be as they seem to be. How's that gonna shape our story? That's the question we're talking about this week. How does God's word shape our story? What should we learn from a counterfeit trinity? From the idea that at the end of Earth's history, there'll be many claims to God. And the true God may be difficult to find in those many claims. How does that shape our story? Here's my suggestion. We need to study the Bible like we've never studied it before. 
I know we're all busy. I know that life is, is full of challenges today more than ever. I know that this little object can consume a lot of time. I know that there's television, there's internet, there's so many different opportunities, so many ways to make a little money, so many ways to deal with life's challenges. It is at time like this that we need to be reminded that the Bible is our first mission. If we are to fulfill our mission as Seventh-day Adventists is to put the Bible front and center, not just in words, but in actions in everyday life. We need to pray as we've never prayed before. And I suggest we need self-distrust. Because the temptation is to say, well, I've studied my Bible. I did my 16 lessons when I was baptized. I know what Seventh-day Adventists teach. We're ready for the end. Well, we're not done with this sermon. And that may be misplaced confidence. Self-distrust means that we hold out the possibility that we have something more to learn. And I believe we have a lot more to learn. And when we distrust ourselves enough to let the Word of God speak, it can change our lives. There's a parallel passage to chapter 13, and that's Revelation 16, 13. I saw out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. Who are these guys? It's our three again. The dragon, the sea beast, the false prophet. Let's compare. In chapter 13, the unholy trinity was a dragon, a sea beast, and a land beast. Here, it's the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Same three guys. Different name, different face, but same three guys. Now, some of you may have in the back of your mind the question, what right does he have to jump from one text to another? Can't preachers kind of jump around to prove anything they want? So there's got to be a reason for going from chapter 13 to chapter 16. You know, you've heard the story, haven't you, about the fellow who didn't know his Bible but needed a word from the Lord, and so he dropped his Bible, put his finger on it without looking, and he looked at the text, and it said, Judas went out and hanged himself. All right, some of you have heard this. That didn't seem particularly helpful, so he did it again, and this time the text said, Go and do thou likewise, right? <laughs> that still didn't seem particularly helpful. And so he did it a third time, and it said, what thou doest, do quickly. <laughs> <laughs> you see, the point is this. You can put text together to prove anything you want to prove, if you're creative enough. What right did I have to go from chapter 13 to chapter 16? These two are on the same subject. The end time deception is the subject of chapter 13. It's also the subject of this part of chapter 16. So we're on the same subject and using the same language. You have the dragon and the other two beasts. So the same characters appear again. They didn't appear in 14 and 15, but now they come back in chapter 16. So the author of Revelation is telling you, the explanation of chapter 13 is coming here, all right? Now, you remember, Seventh-day Adventist self-confidence would suggest we don't have to worry about the end-time deception. We got that all figured out, okay? But let's take a closer look. I saw out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. 
Why frogs? Well, one thing you notice when you study Revelation 16 is that the details of chapter 16 are all drawn from the plagues of the Exodus. If you go back to the Exodus story, you know, Moses and the bulrushes and all of that, if you go back to the Exodus story, the plagues of the Exodus are the ground of the plagues of the end time. And here's an interesting fact. When Moses came to Pharaoh, he needed to get Pharaoh's attention. And so he took his shepherd's rod, threw it on the ground, and it became a snake. And Pharaoh was terrified. He says, what kind of power is this? You know, this is terrifying. Take that thing away. And his magicians, you know what they did? They threw their walking sticks down, and they became snakes too. And you know what it said to Pharaoh? Hey, he's got power. We've got power. He's got gods. We've got gods. We can handle this. Then Moses said, all right, come down with me to the Nile. And he put his staff in the river, and it turned into blood. And again, Pharaoh was, oh, no. And then his magicians came with a bowl of water and turned that into blood. He says, oh, power against power, gods against gods. We can handle this. And then came the plague of frogs. And you have to understand, Egyptians worshipped frogs. If you think that's crazy, they also worshipped beetles. But anyway, it's another story. They worshipped frogs, and I can see God looking down on Egypt, and he says, these people really like frogs. Let me help them out, you see. And I don't know how they did this, but somehow Pharaoh's magicians brought frogs as well. What was happening is they were counterfeiting the work of God to convince Pharaoh that he was in control. But here's the key to the story. After the plague of frogs, they could duplicate none of the other plagues. From that time on in the story, Pharaoh's magicians were helpless. The frogs were the last deception on Egypt. That's why the frogs are here. We're about to discover the last deception of Earth's history, what it's actually going to be like. It comes from three unclean spirits like frogs, replaying the Exodus story. I saw out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. Who are these guys? They are the spirits of demons. What's a demon? It's an evil angel. It's an angel that follows Satan rather than the true God. So you have three angels here. And what do these three angels of Satan do? They do signs which go out to the kings of the whole inhabited world to gather them for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. We don't just have a true trinity and a counterfeit trinity. Take a look at this. You have an evil trinity, a true trinity. You have three frogs. You have three angels, chapter 14. The three frogs go out to the world. The three angels go out to the world. What do the three frogs represent? A counterfeit gospel, a counterfeit gospel. You will not only have a counterfeit trinity, you have a counterfeit of the gospel going out into the world. There will be a message right out of Scripture talking about Jesus, and it'll be counterfeit. Now, you know why counterfeits work? It's not because they're totally different. Counterfeits work when they look just like the original. In the last days of Earth's history, things will not be what they seem to be. The three frogs are a counterfeit of the gospel. 
Now do you realize why preparation for this is so important? Two competing claims to truth. But I'm afraid it gets even worse. Let's go to that famous text, Revelation 16, 16, the battle of Armageddon. He gathered them to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The Greek actually has an H sound there. So it's Armageddon rather than Armageddon. The Armageddon actually comes from the Latin. That's how it got into the King James Bible. But it's actually har Megiddon in the original. So in the Hebrew, Har means mountain. And Megiddon is the Greek word used to translate the Hebrew word Megiddo. So if you take the language at face value, Har Megiddon means mountain of Megiddo. But here's where things get a little strange. Because you can go all over the world and search, and you won't find a mountain named Megiddo. So what's going on here? We have a mountain that doesn't exist. Well, it's the book of Revelation. It's a cartoon fantasy. So it's pointing us to something else. There's no mountain named Megiddo. There is a city called Megiddo. And the ruins of that city are in a valley that's sometimes called the Valley of Megiddo. I had the privilege of going to the ruins of ancient Megiddo. And they're quite impressive ruins. It was a city that was uh, part of northern Israel uh, during much of Bible times. And that city is at the edge of the valley, kind of a slightly elevated place at the edge of the valley. And there is a mountain that looms over the city. Ever been to Seattle? You got a big old mountain looming over the city. Ever been to Portland, Oregon? Big old mountain looming over the city. All right, sometimes cities are associated with their mountains. Tokyo, it's Mount Fuji, you see? The mountain of Megiddo, what do you suppose it was? It's Mount Carmel, Mount Carmel. If you stand in the ruins of Megiddo and you look up, there's a mountain looming over that city, and it's Mount Carmel. And the high point on that mountain is the place where Elijah met the prophets of Baal. If you know that Old Testament story, there were two claims to God. You had Yahweh and you had Baal. There were two sets of prophets you had Elijah, and you had the prophets of Baal. They set up two altars, one altar for Yahweh, one altar for Baal. And they made the challenge. The God who brings fire down on his altar is the true God. And the prophets of Baal prayed all day, went crazy dancing even cut themselves in their desperation to win this battle. Even were trying to do little back passes, you know, to sneak a little fire in there, see if they could get it going. But Elijah was watchful, didn't let them get away with that. And finally, at the end of the day, Elijah simply kneels down and says, God, show who you are. Fire came down from heaven burned up the sacrifice, burned up the wood, burned up the stones of the altar. That was a hot one. Licked up the water in the trench, the whole thing. And the entire nation realized Yahweh is God, not Baal. We've been heading down the wrong track, okay? In the last days of Earth's history, the Mount Carmel showdown will happen again. There'll be competing claims to deity. And once again, the issue will be settled by fire from heaven. Now, don't misunderstand me. Book of Revelation is a symbolic book. I'm not suggesting that on a literal mountain in Israel, there'll be a literal fire and a literal showdown. 
But this is telling us what happened in ancient Mount Carmel will happen again at the end of time. There'll be the same kind of showdown, the same kind of claims, and there's going to be a decisive intervention that will make clear to the world who the true God is. But there'll be one difference at the end of the world. Revelation 13, 13. And he, the land beast, does great signs, so much so that he causes fire to come down out of heaven to earth in the presence of men. Do you see the implications of that? In the great end time Mount Carmel, the fire falls on the wrong altar. What your eyes see, what your ears hear, what your hands handle, what you can touch, taste, and smell, in the last days of earth's history will deceive you. It doesn't matter to me if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, a Lutheran, a Catholic, a Muslim. The issues of the end time are issues for all. And again, we come to it out of a secular world which is accustomed to downplaying the evidences of spiritual reality, downplay miracles, downplay the presence of God, to trust in the five senses, the whole scientific mentality. Science is a wonderful thing, has done many great things for all of us. But science is wedded to the five senses. There are realities in the universe we can't see, hear, touch, taste, and smell. And science can't tell us about those. So the spiritual realities are larger than that. That is why Seventh-day Adventists are here. We're not here because we're the only Christians. In fact, as I shared at the beginning, we're probably not here because we're the best Christians. Because in some situations, at least, we haven't done so well. The point is that God has called a people, a people of prophecy, to point the world to crucial things in the Word of God that people need to know at the end of time. A warning that things will not always be as they seem. That those who trust in the five senses will be deceived. That's the mission. That's the identity of Seventh-day Adventists, to rely on the Word of God. The Word of God has got to be central in our lives and to encourage our neighbors and friends to make the Word of God central, to find ways to make study of the Bible exciting. In the last days of Earth's history, things will not be as they seem. How does that shape our story? Bible study. That we find a way to make the study of the Bible central again in our lives. Now, I don't want you to go away feeling guilty about times you've missed in the past. Today's the first day of the rest of your life. If you feel moved tonight to make the Bible the heart of your life, take the time to do that. Schedule it. Nothing in my life happens if I don't schedule it. It's just too many things going on. Make Bible the first thing of your day, the most important thing of your day. And prayer, I know that prayer is hard. I think Christians get shot down in flames in the prayer life more than anything else. Because it's hard to talk to someone you cannot see, hear, or touch. It isn't easy. Committing to prayer is not the simplest thing. But I just have a suggestion. When you're reading your Bible, Read it on your knees. Or if your knees are like mine, read it sitting down. <laughs> you know, if your knees are not that good anymore. Uh, however you read the Bible, however you pray, talk to God about what you're reading. That's prayer. In, pr in the Bible, God is talking to you. In prayer, you talk back to God. So if you think of reading the Bible prayerfully, prayer is not boring. 
Prayer is not talking to nothing. Prayer is talking to God in the Word as God is speaking to you, responding to Him. That's a beautiful text. I really appreciate that, Lord. Help me to put that into my life today. And finally, self-distrust. When you realize the Mount Carmel that is coming, to go in absolute confidence and say, we got it all figured out would be a big mistake. We need to be humble before the Word of God and let God open himself to us as never before. That's how Revelation 13 shaped my story. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. There's much more in this text than what we did tonight. But I think we touched on what really, really matters. You let us know ahead that there's going to be some serious spiritual challenges ahead, and we can only face them through your word and through the presence of your spirit. I invite you to draw each person hearing my voice into a fresh commitment, study and prayer and self-distrust. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. We would like to thank the constituency of the Central California Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for making this program possible and from viewers just like you. Thank you.